Hello everyone! Today we'll be going through a video that I think everyone is going to be reacting to very soon, as Extra Credits has done it again. As about two years ago, they released a video saying stop normalising Nazis, in which they argued that because you play as Nazis in some multiplayer games, that is normalising becoming a Nazi and will turn people to the far right. Though to be fair, it probably has one of my all-time favourite clips. There you are, playing the PvP in your World War II shooter, and all of a sudden, you're a Nazi. Yes, out of everything, that is what turned me right-wing, playing as the Nazis in Call of Duty World at War. Anyway, I did a video covering it about two years ago, and honestly, this video is going to be pretty much the same. Where extra credit give me absolutely balls-to-the-wall retarded arguments, and I obviously argue back using Ben Shapiro-style facts and logic. So anyway, let's get into it. Evil races are bad game design. Let's have a look. If you paid attention to the game's discourse on the internet during 2019 and 2020, you might have noticed a reoccurring argument about some species from fantasy media, specifically orcs. Yes, I remember people thinking that orcs represented real-world races, and I thought that was a particularly racist thing to do, to play off stereotypes and apply them to real-world races, because I am not a racist. Now not to worry, this episode isn't going to be just another member of the chorus talking about how if all orcs in a game are blindly evil, that it's racist. Yes, I'm sure you are not going to make that argument at any point in this video. Instead, we want to discuss how that particular choice is simply bad game design. Yes, I'm sure you are going to keep the conversation purely on game design. And I'm sure I'm going to have compelling arguments telling me why having certain creatures act and play in a consistent way that that is indeed bad game design, but anyway... Let's get into the video. Real quick up top, please welcome James Mendez Hodes, who guest wrote this episode. Thanks so much, Mendez. If you don't have any idea who it is, don't worry, I didn't either. For a quick biography, James is a Filipino-American writer, game designer, cultural consultant, and martial artist from the New York metropolitan area. And apparently he is noted for winning an Emmy Award for his work on role-playing games like Seventh Sea and Scion. Never heard of that game, to be honest. He writes a blog, I mean, who cares? And apparently he translated Homer's Iliad into rap. Apparently Extra Credits thinks this guy is famous or something and that we just know who he is, but no, we don't. So there you go. I did more work for you than Extra Credits put into this video. Much of the recent conversation on orcs points out that characterizing a whole species in your game as ugly, warlike, and malevolent might be harmful to real-world groups regularly mischaracterized as ugly, warlike, and malevolent. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, it never crossed my mind that orcs are like black people, as you clearly think in this image. Orcs are evil, ugly, and warlike. They are like that throughout fantasy stories. They always tend to live in tribes, they always tend to like war, and they do always look ugly. Now, if you want to create a different species that is the complete opposite of these, i.e. elves, and call them orcs, that is also fine, but clearly they are going off the Tolkien D&D classic fantasy route when it comes to orcs. And they apparently think that this is related to black people, which I don't know anyone who made that connection before extra credits and before the conversations going on in 2019 started trying to make the argument, which again, I just think is absolutely retarded. However, this video isn't that. Though if you want more on that discussion, Mendez breaks it down wonderfully over on his website and we'll have a link to that in the description. I'm glad you asked. Yes, we are indeed going to quickly go through some of his arguments there. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, this article is biblical, so I'm only going to take out snippets. And some of his references are iffy at best. For instance, when he goes on about how the term Caucasian is racist, his source is an MTV Decoded video with Francesca Ramsey, which are probably the least useful source I can think of off the top of my head. So that goes to show you about how good this article is going to be. But to be honest, there's only one particular part that I want to read. So after going on about the British history of designating some particular ethnic groups as quote-unquote warrior races, such as the Gurkhas, because they were very good at fighting and willing to fight for the British. He then goes on to blame Tolkien for growing up in this world where this is, was the general way people thought, and using it as inspiration for his book. For instance, in Tolkien's world, the orcs are basically corrupted elves, literally bred for evil. They are a result of eugenics, essentially, which is another reason that they are ugly. And James decides that this is a racist caricature, as he says that Mongoloids, Negroids, and other people of colour, in Tolkien's view apparently, 
are corrupt, degenerate versions of the noble white Caucasians whom they resent, which through poor argumentation he tries to support. Tolkien also described the orcs in his book as Mongol-like, which, if you know your history, you will know that the Mongol horde was very much known for being warlike and generally evil. Most of us from Europe are descended from Genghis Khan, and it's not due to consensual sex. But then near the end of the article, there is the title, But It's Only Fantasy, to which he replies, sure, and if you call me a racial slur, it's only words. Which I don't think he realises, yes, that it is indeed only words. But does intent matter? Because I think Tolkien's own words in previous sections make his intent pretty clear. He's telling a story about good and evil, where good is explicitly identified with England, evil is explicitly identified with Asians, and the means for communicating those concepts is a catalogue of classic racism. Now, of course, the Shire is, of course, based off England's green and pleasant land. Rohan is probably a reference to the medieval stylings of Eastern Europe, where they were generally known for their cavalry riders. And Gondor, I suppose, is more Western Europe, and what helped make the generic culture of men in fantasy. But of course, I don't think any of this matters anyway. To which Mendez replies, but maybe you still think it doesn't matter. Maybe you think, in fact, that applying these Asian stereotypes to a fantasy race who might look like but aren't real Asian people who actually are inherently evil and okay to murder is a safe way to enjoy a fight between good and evil to let the hero look badass and slaughter bad guys without compunction. To which my reply would be, why do you think Asian people are ugly? But I think this last paragraph is the most insane. Designing a fantasy universe based on racist theories whose purpose is to uphold the acts of violence and dehumanisation towards an exaggerated intentional stand-in for my family is not okay. Oh my god, useful stops. Any more than laughing at minstrel shows is okay if it's just white people with shoe polish on their face, not black people. Well, minstrel shows, by definition, need to have white people in blackface. The act is akin to making up speculative fiction race, where women really are simple-minded, commodified sex objects, because you really wish you could reduce women to simple-minded, commodified sex objects without offending actual women. Is all over the place with this paragraph. But yes, you can make any fantasy world you want with any rules you want, and if you base them off what your concept is of the real world, that is also fine. But clearly, assuming he did base orcs off Asian stereotypes, which I think at best you can say it was inspired by some Asian stereotypes when it came specifically to the Mongol horde, then yes, that's fine, and most people enjoy it. But most people don't see an orc and go, yes, that is an Asian, all Asians look ugly, are warlike and evil. Because most people have this thing called a brain, where it can differentiate reality and fantasy. And it appears yours can't. And so Extra Credits has taken this and are now trying to say, oh, okay, we need to find another reason why orcs being, well, orcs are bad for game design. Because they genuinely think that orcs represent Asian people, which is crazy. Because the whole conversation in 2019 was that they were supposed to represent black people, but Mendez is saying it represents Asian people because he is part Asian himself, so he's trying to get victim dollars for that. Even though he's not Mongolian, so yeah, it's essentially a really weak race grift. But anyway, let's see what extra credits have to say to excuse their racism. But here, we're going to talk about something related. Why characterizing a group like this in your game can be lazy at best, and at worst, actively harmful to the world you're creating. Well, let's be fair here. That is exactly what Tolkien did with his Lord of the Rings and Middle-earth books, and they are considered some of the greatest works of fiction ever created, so I don't think you can say that this type of fantasy writing is either lazy, nor does it destroy fantasy worlds. But anyway, let's hear the arguments. When designing a game's world and populating it with fictional species, a designer might be tempted to differentiate them from one another by certain inalienable qualities, like their moral alignment. Violent versus peaceful, law versus chaos, good versus evil, and the like. I mean, this is just monumentally stupid from the outset. If they don't have discerning characteristics, how the hell are you supposed to differentiate them? You can't just have everything start off as a grey blob. There is no such thing as a blank slate when it comes to individual humans, let alone individual fantasy races. So we're off to a rocky start already, let's see if it improves. It's a common trope in speculative fiction, but especially in the context of a game, painting an entire species with the same moral brush actually weakens the entire thing. 
Nah, bollocks to that. Friend, good. Enemy, bad. This idea that a certain subgroup, like race, nationality, or sex, has inalienable traits, is called biological essentialism, or simply bioessentialism. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You said you weren't going to go into these racist stereotype type arguments. You were just going to talk about game design. And while I agree that you can't just tell someone's bioessentialism just by their race or their gender, etc., that doesn't mean that bioessentialism doesn't exist on some level to an individual. For instance, a super straight person is always bioessentially never going to shag a man consensually. So if you're about to try and completely undermine the idea of bioessentialism, then again, you're on rocky ground. And either way, it's a fantasy world anyway. You can have bioessentialism for entire races. That's literally the whole idea of hive mind races. I mean, that even works in the real world. Just look at ants or bees. And it's a valid way to talk about qualities like how many legs an animal has, or whether it can fly. Well, at least they're not trying to undermine that part. But all too often, this concept gets misused in untrue statements, like pit bulls are a violent breed. They generally are. Men are more logical than women. They generally are. Or Asians are better at math. And with that, I'm not going to tempt YouTube's banhammer anymore. Though to be fair, I don't think when it comes to Asians are better at math stereotype, I don't think that is down to biological essentialism. I think that is more down to the work ethic that a lot of Asian families generally have, which is very good. So I wouldn't class that under biological essentialism anyway. Now chances are, if a game is set in the real world, that the designers are avoiding these tropes because they aren't real, as multiple fields of societal and hard science can readily prove to you. I mean, I completely agree that stereotypes like this are not applicable to the majority of what the stereotypes are supposed to be reflecting, but for God's sake, if you are going to say, oh, the science says so, at least saw something, because that is an epitome of trust the experts thinking, and it's not helpful in any way extra credits. But speculative fiction offers us an opportunity to reify or make real various things which don't exist or to exaggerate things which do. Is this your first experience with any type of fiction? Because literally everyone over the age of 10 knows this. Now bioessentialism is a tempting idea in fantasy for some of the same reasons as it is in the real world. Because to our human minds, broad generalizations are comforting. Yes, they paint a low resolution image in our minds that help us categorise and understand the world. It is particularly helpful in quite a lot of ways and not so helpful when a higher resolution image of the world would be better. But it is midwitch thinking to think broad categorizations are not helpful in any way, which is essentially what he's implying here. They reduce the world to simple cut and dry categories. All orcs bad, all elves good, root for these folks, not for these folks. I can't even think of a fancy world where all elves good is true. Even Lord of the Rings, I think, had some bad elves. And I know The Witcher definitely had some bad elves with the Scoyotel. But that was made interesting because they did evil things as they were quite literally being racially discriminated against by the humans of the Witcher world. But that, of course, is where interesting storytelling comes in. But for some reason, extra credit doesn't think that exists. Now, sure, it might exist with most orcs in most fantasy. And again, that's fine. The way you make that interesting is by having conflict in the human world to try and get them to have an alliance against the orcs. That's what made Lord of the Rings interesting, because the steward of Gondor, who was acting regent at the time, refused to partake in the war at all. And you couldn't have that story without the orcs being evil, working under Sauron. But just like in the real world, bioessentialism can present problems in fiction as well, specifically a moral one. The idea that a sapient species can inherently tend towards good or evil acts, or lawful or chaotic ones. And that moral essentialism actually undercuts the greatest strength games can bring to storytelling. It's interesting now that you are saying that it can undercut what, by the way, in your opinion, makes a game world interesting. Rather than, as you said before, this type of thing completely breaks game worlds at the worst. When, as I keep showing with examples from The Witcher and lord of the rings this isn't the case at all the players own power to make meaningful interesting choices and judgments for their characters including moral ones i mean yes that does indeed take it away if they are only evil which is why when you as a dm create a fantasy world you will give them moral choices in other areas i before have been a dm and written my own story a quick summary is that evil elementals were taking over various areas of the land the moral choice came in between how they dealt with the elementals. Do they kill the elemental and vastly change the landscape of the land, making local tribes 
basically have to completely change their lives if you defeat the elementals, or do they capture it and imprison it within the dungeons, which is a hell of a lot harder and riskier, but doesn't destroy the surrounding landscape. I made an interesting moral choice that was only possible with an unreasonable enemy. But for some reason, you th seem to think that absolutely everything has to be overly complex, when in the real world, not everything is overly complex. There are some problems when it comes to other people that are incredibly easy. So if a game's creative choices apply a moral valuation to every member of an entire species before the players even meet them, well, now that's just taking that power away from the players. What a stupid statement. The only way players know that something is evil is through their actions. I have never had a DM like this who just says, yes, all these creatures are evil. They will show me how a particular race or group is evil through their actions. Because yes, they all agree this is what makes it interesting, but you can still have something that is inherently evil without explicitly saying it. You explicitly show it through their actions. Such as armies of the undead just going through tribal settlements absolutely decimating everything. Yes, it's a horde that needs to be stopped. There's nothing wrong with that. And in turn, if a group of orcs, for instance, doesn't even have a choice about their actions, are they actually evil? What do you mean, doesn't have a choice? You do realise these are fantasy creatures and not real. It's entirely up to the storyteller what they do. Because look, if a person, say, destroys a house, we call that evil because they chose to do so. But if a tornado destroys a house, well, I mean, is wind evil? No. Wow, this is such a reach. No one has claimed that wind is evil because of tornadoes. And generally in every fantasy world that has orcs, there is reasoning behind them being evil. Lord of the Rings, they were corrupted and created by Sauron to serve him. They are evil because Sauron is evil and created them. In Dungeons and Dragons, they worship their orc god. And in mythology, all the races settle in different places, so the dwarves in the mountains, the elves in the forest, etc. And it basically pushed the orc god out. So the god they worship was pushed out, and then he waged war on all these other deities. And that is why the orcs are warlike. They believe all the land belongs to them, and that it has been stolen through their mythology, so they try and take it back. That is why they settle in tribes and constantly go to war and pillage settlements. And there is no reason that you can't homebrew an orc who rejects this mythology and tries to cooperate with humans. I'm sure you can make that an interesting story, but most people, when they play, just say, oh, I want to see monster, oh, orc, that'll do. I can set them up as challenges for my group. And at no point do they think, yes, I want this to represent Asian or black stereotypes. It is only you here who is doing that extra credit. Please stop being racists. Therefore, if a game's world building chooses to program every member of a species to destroy, aren't they more like the tornado? No, they are sentient. Tornadoes aren't. This is absolute lunacy. Now, if the player's characters are able to make moral choices, but an entire class of NPCs is inherently evil regardless of their choice, then the game is either telling the player that moral choices don't matter, or it's simply driving a wedge between the player's morality and the morality that applies to the rest of the world. What fantasy world are you playing in where it is only the players versus one evil race? Every D&D campaign I have ever been involved in will have a multitude of races, houses, and groups. This is where the conflict comes in, and generally, quite a lot of places, especially where the players spawn in, will say, hey, these are evil for X, Y, Z reasons, please can you deal with them? And then you can make it more interesting, as I did, by saying, oh, these elementals will affect the local population if you kill them, but if you imprison them it's better, but it's more risky, etc, etc. And this is where the interesting moral conundrum comes in. But for some reason, Extra Credits just thinks, oh, this is evil, therefore you have to destroy it. No, you can make reasons that make sense where that isn't the case. But they ironically seem to have this very low resolution take on fancy worlds, where compromise between groups against the evil doesn't exist. Honestly, I'd never play a D&D game with any of them if this is how they think D&D is supposed to be played blocking the player from further becoming a part of it. For instance, in Warhammer 40k, this inconsistency is central to the Imperium of Man's villainous creed. Individuals' human choices make them good or evil, whereas aliens are created evil. And of course, Games Workshop made that choice to facilitate a war game where lethal violence is the only option. Yes, but again, there are reasonings behind why they are like this. For instance, the Tyranids 
are literally just a hive mind race who are trying to expand their species to other planets. They're essentially the bugs from Starship Troopers. The Tau have their own religious creed where they think they are fighting for the greater good and need to exterminate the rest of the species. And the same generally goes for the Imperium and the Space Marines who are fighting for the Emperor who they see as a deity. And every other race has some form of reasoning behind what they are doing. And even the humans are terrible because they are essentially space fascists. That's what makes it so interesting. Every group is terrible. But again, they seem to completely forget this and think that the Space Imperium are the good guys. No. They are literally a fascist dictatorship with a deity at the helm. Honestly, extra credits just did no research into this. But then folks also saw that in the 40k novels and RPGs, which required more interesting narrative complexities, Imperial heroes have to grapple with and recognize the illogic of that greed based on their own experience. Yes, I agree that would make a more interesting story. But originally Games Workshop just wanted to have an excuse to have all these armies fighting each other. And it's just been built from there. I don't see the issue here. Okay, but now you might be asking, what if you're playing the kind of game where you're engaging in violence because it's exciting and fun? not because of its moral dimensions. That was literally the origin of Warhammer 40,000. Where the meaningful choice is about tactics rather than ethics. Maybe the goal is to take moral calculus out of the problem. Sure, one solution might be saying, all orcs are evil, go ahead and shoot them. But in that situation, as soon as someone inadvertently feels some empathy, as people often do for anything seeming even vaguely alive, the easy answer becomes less easy. Do you honestly think that anyone will have a shred of empathy for an orc horde that is raping and pillaging villages. Because that's what orcs do in pretty much every fantasy game. There is no question that raping and pillaging is evil, especially when it is your allies getting raped and pillaged. And yet your excuse is, oh, but if one person's a psychopath, then it undermines the whole thing. Well, who the hell cares? If the orc is going to kill them, I think their instincts are going to kick in, in this fantasy world anyway. And they are going to say to themselves, well, I don't particularly want to die and this orc is going to kill me anyway. I guess it's him or me. Yes, that does make things a hell of a lot more simple extra credit. Not everything is a moral dilemma, you absolute buffoons. And if the goal of your game is to stop players from engaging in moral debates and just fight some bad guys, you kind of got to say something more reliable than, oh, it's fine, they were all born this way. They don't even necessarily say that. What they say is, oh, look at the actions they're doing. They are going to literally kill you. I mean, most fantasy and sci-fi has been based on this. Look at War of the Worlds. Why are the Martians trying to take people? Oh, they want to eat them and take over the planet. Were they born this way or not? Who the hell cares? They're trying to eat you. Fortunately, the real world's made progress on this problem. Because sometimes in this day and age, people actually bear visual signifiers which say, I'm evil, not because of where I was born, but because of the choices I've made. Yes, amazingly, people don't like orcs because of where they were born. They don't like orcs because of the raping and pillaging they do. Absolute idiots. Such as Nazi uniforms and clan hoods. Then in fiction, we have things like the Hydra logo. A clear visual signifier, but one that denotes choice, not birth. Of course, if a character is born and indoctrinated into a regime, would you say that that denotes bad choices? This is another level onto your morality. I can use the same tornado excuse that you are using to excuse your racism. If a child born under Hydra and indoctrinated by Hydra, let's say the Winter Soldier, who was completely brainwashed into working for Hydra, does it make him evil because of his actions? You would say, oh no, because he didn't have a choice at all. And Marvel actually go through the moral conundrum quite well. It's the whole reason Civil War happens. Because at his core, Bucky the Winter Soldier is not an evil person. He just gets activated by certain code phrases. And that is when he becomes evil and must be stopped. But they need to stop him without killing him because he is Captain America's friend from the war. But when it comes to people who are completely indoctrinated into an ideology that is evil, and no matter how hard you try, they can't shake the indoctrination, what do you do with those people? Would you say they are evil? And if yes, I would have to ask you, why is that different to the whirlwind? But not everything in fantasy has to be this moral conundrum. I don't, again, see a problem with just having a whole race as evil in fantasy. Because it's fantasy, you absolute lunatic. And if the statement that a game is making with its backstory and symbols is that an enemy had a choice and they chose wrong, then that gets way less complicated for a game that's interested in uncomplicated violence. Again, why does it matter either way? It 
and it's entirely dependent upon the person writing the story or the game. And again, what do you define as a choice in this regard? I unironically think they are going to advocate at one point for Cthulhu to be a good guy, which entirely misses the point of Lovecraft, but there we go. So whether a game does or doesn't want its players to overthink their characters' moral choices, evil as a choice is just more effective than evil as a bioessential trait. Yeah, here's some really good advice, extra credits. If you're going to try and say, oh, <laughs> a story where evil is always a choice is better than bioessential evil, don't use one of the best sci-fi horror films of all time as an example to state this. Because from what I see in this video, Alien is much better than any story or excuse you can come up with to justify the fact that you think orcs represent black people or Asian people. Because ultimately I'm always going to choose a world where the aliens are always evil and trying to kill people no matter what. Which by the way it explains that it's purely instinct and the will to survive that is causing this alien to kill people. Rather than your bog standard, oh the Nazis are evil because they like evil things. But they chose to do the evil things and that makes it more interesting. No, you can't make that categorical statement. It's stupid. But then, of course, if everyone wearing the evil team uniform happens to be an orc, or if every orc happens to have chosen team evil, the game wouldn't exactly be communicating that difference very well. Oh my god, I think he's going to say we need more diversity when it comes to evil. He's unironically going to make the more trans war criminals argument, but in a fancy world, watch. Watch, he will do that. A quick fix here would be to show some diversity in the evil team's hiring practices. More trans war criminals. For instance, with evil humans and elves as well as orcs. There were literally evil men in Lord of the Rings. Every fantasy genre has evil men and elves. They just don't necessarily coincide with what the orcs want. Which, as I keep having to explain in this video, is where the interesting moral conundrums come in. You can have a great evil that can't be reasoned with, and that can be a race, and it can still make for interesting moral choices. You're just saying all this to excuse the fact, again, you think the orc stereotype coincides with other real world stereotypes, which is what literally no one else is thinking. I have not met a single wignat who says, oh yeah, the orcs are black people. It is literally only SJWs doing this, which is crazy when you think about it. Or conversely, introduce orcs who have chosen good and neutral, as well as evil. Yes, I'm sure that can make for an interesting story. But if every world ends up like this, then no, you are not going to have interesting stories. There have been fantasy worlds made where orcs are more than just pure evil. And I'm sure they're interesting, but I haven't personally read them. And a good example of a series getting better and better at this over time is Mass Effect. My god, the last thing I'd do is cite a game that has been getting worse and worse over time, as what extra credits want here is getting better and better. That is a terrible example. Because in the first game, Commander Shepard never meets a nice Batarian or a fun Geth. But then, spoiler alert, most of these evil species turn out to be as complex and interesting as the human ones as the trilogy progresses. Cool, from what I hear, the story of the original three Mass Effects is pretty good. And this could indeed be part of the reason why, but I don't see why it is necessarily the reason why. But you have been categorically making out that, oh, you have to have diversity of every race, otherwise the story's boring. I, no, I just can't agree with that. Because of the many examples I have cited before, inalienable characteristics of races does make stories interesting. Dryads from the Witcher, forest dwellers, experts with bow and arrows, and completely take over a forest, and any man who tries to go in unwelcomed gets one warning shot, and then the other goes through the eye. Witches, specialised in hunting monsters, are completely infertile and have basic grasps of magic. Whereas sorcerers have a wider grasp of magic and constantly try to play their own political game until the kings get fed up of it and try to kill them all. And of course the kings are constantly at war until they all need to ally against the Nilfgaardian army who are trying to take over the known world. Again, all this interesting stuff that already exists extra credits. It's no one's fault that stereotypes are an easy way to understand particular races of character when it comes to fiction. If you don't like it, make your own damn game world or fantasy world or whatever. I don't care. But the way you've been talking now doesn't make it seem that interesting. Anyway, let's finish this off. Broad moral generalizations about species or culture not only doesn't make internal sense, but it also leads to less evocative, less rewarding worlds and games. Two categorical statements that I have completely undermined 
with many references throughout this. You saying Hydra from Marvel and the diversity of morals within race in Mass Effect does not necessarily make them better stories than The Lord of the Rings, which is clearly where your issues derive from. And the majority of people would agree with that. Most people agree that Lord of the Rings is the best fantasy novel ever created. Yet you saying it is categorically better has not been supported in any way by your references. I mean, you even referenced Alien as an immutably evil character. And the Alien franchise, well, the first two Alien films, I should say, were some of the best horror ever created. So you can't just categorically say that having diverse morals in a race in a fantasy world is better than having orcs which are all evil. Doesn't work that way. You need to up your game. But we can solve that problem by following our best creative instincts to diversify, deepen, and complicate the worlds we create and its denizens. Again, you are free to do that, but that doesn't mean you can't have complex moral choices just because a few races are immutably evil or good. But if you want good Cthulhu monsters, be my guest. I just can't imagine it's that interesting. This way, players won't be incentivized to make snap judgments about our game's orcs or aliens or undead based on moral absolutes or body types. You haven't actually pointed out what makes that bad. You're just trying to say that moral complexity makes game good. Again, I don't know how many times I'm going to say this in this video. That's not necessarily true, and what you have cited shows that it's not true. And even when you tried to cite 40k, you got the details wrong, for God's sake. Instead, we'll all be driven to investigate, explore, and learn. Again, having a race that is inherently evil doesn't necessarily take away from that, for God's sake. Our players will invest themselves more in our games. And because they're human, ask the hard questions to push our design into even more enriching and unexpected places. Yes, Tolkien's Middle Earth wasn't pushed into different and unexpected places at all. It was just one very simple-minded good versus evil story. It didn't have a whole situation with Gondor trying to convince the steward there to ally with men. It didn't have moral conundrums with Sam and Frodo about Gollum. And it didn't have Merry and Pippin trying to convince the Ents that they need to join the war to fight evil. Had none of that. Had none of these interesting places that it could go to. No, all orcs bad, therefore an interesting. What a stupid take. Plus, you know, maybe if we ditch this whole evil races line of thinking, if one day orcs or extra-dimensional horrors or even isekai protagonists pop out of a portal, they'll offer us humans the same courtesy. Oh my god, he unironically tried to push for a good Cthulhu. This is your mind on crack, people. Futurama tried to make an interdimensional beast fall in love with the entire universe we live in, and it was very funny. But it was parody. It was parody of this exact thinking, you idiot. Because the idea behind it would be incredibly boring. Oh, we've got an interdimensional, all-powerful being on our side. Oh, well, we win easily. Against what? Oh, I don't know, Nazis. Because it's always Nazis with you, and you think for some reason every Nazi had the choice to be a Nazi. Absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, that's the end of the video. Apparently extra credits have absolutely no creativity, because all they think is, oh, everything has to be diverse. When really I think creativity comes from restrictions. So orcs, yes, they're always evil, they're always going to rape and pillage, how do you deal with that? And then it can come to moral dilemmas, trying to get allies, and trying to find out if you want to commit war crimes against them or not. As it might be easier to take them all out with a nuke, but decimate the women and children who you might not necessarily think are a threat. Or you go for a war of attrition, that will take longer and is riskier, but ultimately comes with less moral evils. Anyway, I've had enough of trying to point out the flaws in their arguments. Yes, they're all racist. Yes, they think that because some fancy races are inherently evil, that means we must necessarily think that some races in the real world are necessarily evil. Which I obviously don't, and I still enjoy fantasy, where orcs are inherently evil. So, I completely disprove them, and I'm sure most people watching this video will disprove them. But anyway... That was everything I had for you today. I hope your brain is still intact, because mine barely is after watching that. But anyway, as usual, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.